This is a brand new Microsoft Surface 7 with the X Elite Snapdragon chip inside. It's a Windows for ARM machine. So far in my testing, this machine is looking pretty good performance wise. This machine and also the X Plus, I'll be doing more performance reviews of these machines and the videos coming up. They might already be up by the time you're watching this, but let's get on with the development setup from scratch. Now, one thing about this, I'm gonna focus on the tools that I use. There's a lot of different kinds of developers out there doing all kinds of different development. So keep that in mind mind and to help you decide whether you want to watch these sections or not i'm going to leave the chapters down below so you can skip around but keep in mind that i will build on top of what i'm already doing in each of the sections so if you come to a section and you're thinking what why is he in ubuntu i thought this was supposed to be a windows setup well you might have missed the section where i installed wsl and all the tools that are needed for that uh, because there's going to be a few tools that are going to work inside wsl and i prefer to use them inside of the linux environment that wsl provides wsl is windows subsystem for Linux specifically now because uh, some of the installations are going to be easier for Linux with ARM than on Windows for ARM. So in each section, I'll tell you what I'm installing, why I'm installing it, and I'll do a couple of tests showing how these environments run. Make sure you have your coffee handy. I already got mine. Let's do this. The first thing I do when I get a new machine is make sure that everything is up to date and this being a brand new system and not just a brand new system, a brand new chip that just came out, it's probably going to have some updates. So let's go to update and check for updates. I've already done this. It just takes a little while to do. Assuming you have updates done, let's begin with the setup. First, I'm going to go to task manager. You can search for it here and you can open this up or you can right click on the task bar and start up task manager that way. This will show you you everything that's running on your machine by the way if you peek over here under the details that's this tab right here if you expand this you'll see details you'll see what architecture things are running at and you'll see that most of the things are already on arm arm 64 i sorted by architecture here and we only have two things that are running that are still not converted probably soon they will be that's office click to run and microsoft edge update shame shame that edge update is still x86 but it's not a mission critical thing so it should be fine now let's go to startup apps take a look at the startup impact anything that you see in here that has a high impact on startup and you're not familiar with it uh, turn it off for example i'm not a onedrive user you might be i'm not so i'm going to disable that because i don't want any kind of apps to interfere with the startup of my system that i don't even use i don't want edge to start up so i'm going to disable that too i'm going to start edge when i want to start edge if i want to start edge huh? edge has become pretty good recently i still usually reach for chrome though when i need to do web development and Microsoft Teams. It's not measured. Well, it doesn't need to be because I'm going to disable it. The nice thing about Windows for ARM is there's a lot less bloat here than X64 Windows was. And that's nice to see. A lot less stuff for us to clean up in the beginning. We're done in Task Manager. Now, if you're curious about the performance, you can take a look here. There's a new section here called NPUs. Uh, it'd be nice to keep track of that as you're developing, as well as the CPU and GPU, because that's a new section that uh, if you're doing any kind of machine learning, keep an eye on this one. So let's go close out of that and and let's go to settings. Now settings has the app section, which also has a startup section of its own. Here we've got uh, a few things that could be on. Um, I like what's going on right now. Everything is pretty much turned off right now. Windows security notification icon. I'm fine if that one is turned on. We're good here as far as startup apps. Let's back up, go to system and then power and battery. Now, when you're in power and battery, you have a power mode available to you. And right now it's set to recommended. So it's going to try and balance things out. In fact, if you go and use the old control panel power options to go in there, you just type in power and you can go to choose power plan. And right there you'll see select plan. It's balanced. It's the only option that that it's giving you in the UI, you can change that through the command line, but in the UI, that's what you get. And by the way, I like to change the settings to never, 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 never. I don't want the computer put to sleep and I don't want it to be turned off on battery power. Sorry, that's just how I do it, but you can do your own thing. But how do we squeeze the most performance out of this machine. Well, back here under system power and battery, you can change the power mode to better performance or best performance. Set it to best performance. That's my personal recommendation. Now, the interesting thing about the UI here is you have different UIs and different settings based on um, some legacy stuff that's still around even in Windows for ARM. So this power options here that says the plan is balanced, it's from the control panel days. This right here, this UI is newer, but they don't mirror each other 
at least not in the way you'd expect. So I've changed the performance mode here, the power mode to best performance, but here nothing changed. It's not reflected at all. There is a way to surface another power plan here. And if you go to terminal, so just type in terminal, open that up. This will pop open PowerShell. You can type in power CFG and then slash list. This will give you um, the power plan that's available on your machine. However, it was not going to give you all the power plans available. There are other power plans. And if you search for Windows power plans, you'll get a page like this on the Microsoft documentation, which will give you the IDs of the different power plans. Balance is the one that's showing right now, but there's also high performance and there's also ultimate performance. Now, usually for enterprise workstation type of systems, the high performance and the ultimate performance do make a difference. The ultimate performance just ignores any kind of energy savers at all and just goes balls to the wall. High performance, I think, is what we're going to use here. I'm going to demonstrate this with high performance and I'm going to copy this grid here, this ID and go back to my PowerShell and I'm going to say power CFG set active and then paste in that GUID. Boom. Now it doesn't appear to have done anything. So let's go back to our power options, go back a little bit to hardware and sound and then go to choose power plan again. And now you'll see the UI updated and now it has high performance as one of the options. Now I've run some basic single core tests so far using just the best performance power mode on balanced power plan and high performance power plan. And I didn't get much of a difference. That's just a single core operation. Multi-core might be different, but I'm still going to err on the side of caution here and leave this as high performance because I want to squeeze the most amount of juice. I like performance. Now let's go back here to apps. I just want to take a peek at installed apps because there's usually stuff in here that I'm never going to use. Now just because I don't use these things doesn't mean you don't use them. So pick and choose your own stuff. I just don't like bloat on the system. So I'm going to remove these things like OneNote. I never use that. So I'm going to uninstall that. Done. Uh, Teams. I don't typically use that, but sometimes I do. So I'm going to keep that one. Microsoft to do. I do not use that. And Spotify, I don't know why that's installed by default. I like to use the web player, so I'm just going to remove this one. I'll be honest, I don't know what some of these are, like web media extensions. So I'm going to leave that one alone just in case. I'm going to uninstall the Xbox stuff. And there's one thing here that I noticed that's not here by default that used to be here all the time, McAfee. And I don't know why it's not here, but I'm happy it's not. Because I got sick and tired of uh, Windows always bugging me with McAfee updates and forcing me to scan and scaring me into to, oh, you might have a virus. Windows already comes with pretty decent protection and maybe McAfee didn't update their software to ARM yet or maybe some other reason. I'm just glad it's not here. All right, that's it for apps. Let's go over here to accessibility and visual effects. There's uh, some special effects that are generated and that takes up CPU and GPU cycles. In order to squeeze out as much possible performance out of this thing, I'm gonna turn off these animation effects and transparency effects. I don't really care much for them. If you do, you can keep them on. I'll search for advanced system settings. So view advanced system settings. This is going to bring up the old control panel system properties under performance. Go to settings here and it says let Windows choose what's best for my computer. No, I'll choose what's best for my computer. Thank you very much. Adjust for best performance. Look at that. It turns all those things that were on. It turns them off because they're not necessary. Yes, it's not going to look as pretty. OK, if you choose for best performance. So you're going to have to try a few of these and see what you personally like the best. For example, show thumbnails instead of icons. Sometimes you want to see thumbnails of your photos instead of icons. These are all nice little benefits of having a modern system. But if you're planning to use this as a strictly development machine for best performance, turn that stuff off. All right, back in settings. Let's go back here under system and notifications. All right, notifications really annoy me, especially when I'm trying to work down here under additional settings. Expand that. Suggest ways to get the most out of Windows. No. No, thank you. Uh, get tips and suggestions. No. Show the Windows welcome experience. No. Turn all that off. That stuff is all annoying. I'm just going to turn all these off because I don't like to be bothered while I'm working. There are different focus states now, so you could create a focus state and switch it on and off. I'm not going to bother doing that right now, but you could play around with that. So you can switch focus on, have it turn all the notifications off at that point, and then set it to a different focus level when you're done with work and you want to play. All right. Now let's take a look at security. Go to privacy and security up here, Windows security, and make sure that everything 
everything is up to date here. Open Windows Security, Virus and Threat Protection. Make sure you're up to date on this stuff. Folks, we're almost done with the setup here. There's a couple of developer options I want to show you. Let's go back to Settings and then System. And then scroll down. There's a little section called Ford Developers. Click on that. If you didn't do this during Windows Setup, then you can do it now. I'm going to switch this thing on. And it says, Turning on Developer Mode, including installing and running apps from outside the Microsoft Store, could expose your device and personal data to security risks and harm your device. We're developers. We're used to security risks and harmful stuff, right? Aren't you? <laughs> anyway, it's developer mode. We're going to turn it on. Turn on end task, which will give you the ability to right click and end task. I love that feature. That way I don't have to go scrolling through task manager to end some task. If I have a stuck program, for example, that I'm working on, this is a good feature. File Explorer. Let's expand that feature. Show file extensions. Yes, of course. Show hidden system files. Yes. Just turn all these on. I just like to have all this on. Useful information. Information that's not hidden from us. It's good. Under terminal, I'm going to say, I want Windows Terminal. PowerShell. There are times during your development where you're going to want to use the terminal to install software or to do something um, that an administrator should be able to do. And simply running it from PowerShell, you're going to get an error message doing it. So you need to set an execution policy, which is going to be unrestricted. Now, this is going to put power in your hands to potentially endanger your device, but such is life. So set execution policy. And I don't believe that this is going to work. Unrestricted. I think we need to be an admin in order to do this. So here's an example of um, a problem you might run into, for example, right? It's going to be all red like this if you're doing something that's not allowed. So to set the execution policy as unrestricted, you need to run PowerShell as admin and you need to remember how to do this. I'm going to close everything down here so you can type in terminal here. And then on the right side, if you pop open this little menu, it's going to say run as administrator. So you can click that to run this terminal app as an admin. Now, I like to pin the terminal to the taskbar because I use my mouse a lot and I just find it easier to click on the taskbar to pull up the terminal. It's that easy. And one other way to run the terminal quickly as an admin is to hold down shift and right click. And then you get the run as administrator option. So let's click on that. Yes. And now you'll see that it says administrator Windows PowerShell at the top, which will allow us to set execution policy to unrestricted. Boom. It doesn't really say anything, but if you want to confirm, you just say get execution policy and it'll tell you what it is now. We've already configured the execution policy, so you can leave that alone because if you mess with this one, uh, it might give you a different kind of execution policy. Let me show you. If you do get execution policy dash list, you'll see that under current user, you have remote signed and local machine is unrestricted. When you change this to on, if you didn't have it on before, it'll give you that current user remote signed. See now it's restricted because I turned it off. So remote signed means that whatever you're executing will be signed. You can override that and be even more dangerous. Sorry to rehash this, but I just want to show you this. Set execution policy, scope current user, and then dash execution policy unrestricted. Boom. Now, if you do list, you'll see that both the current user and local machine are unrestricted. Okay, we're done with this. Just set it to that. Don't blame me if something bad happens. Okay, don't blame me. Then this is a new feature. This is only available on the 24H2 Windows, which means these new Copilot X Elite machines. It's probably going to come to the other machines, the Intel based machines very soon. Enable sudo. This enables you to run sudo instead of having to do run as administrator for applications. So normally, if you want to open up the terminal as administrator, you'd hold down shift and right click. And then you have the run as administrator option here. You don't have to do that anymore with sudo. So I've enabled that, of course. All right, now comes the fun part. We're going to install WSL. If you haven't heard of it, WSL is Windows subsystem for Linux. There's two versions of it, WSL one and the new version, the one you should be using on this machine is WSL two, probably could have guessed that. And that'll give you a little virtual machine running the full Linux kernel right inside Windows. It's really cool. So to install it, you just do WSL dash dash install. Boom is downloading it. Now it says installing, enabling features. This is now a fully automated process. And now it says installing Ubuntu. That's the default. There is other distros you can install, but Ubuntu is the default and it's going to get the latest. And this is going to be the ARM version of Ubuntu. That's good and bad uh, at the same time. Uh, it's good because you'll be running fully native. It's bad because you might be following some instructions on how to install something or how to build something. But the instructions were designed for an x64 system and those packages that you're downloading might not be available. So 
there's always that risk. Now, I've done already a bunch of stuff on the system that probably is a good idea to restart now at this point. I just feel like I have to do that all the time with Windows. But now it's actually telling me Ubuntu has been installed. You should probably restart now. So let's do it. You'll see in the menu that I already have Ubuntu icon there. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Restart. And once you're restarted, let's go to terminal again, pop that open. And you'll see from this drop down that you now have Ubuntu there. Let's click in there. And the first time you're going to do it, it's going to take a couple more seconds to do its thing to finish the installation or maybe a minute. And you might run into this WSL register distribution failed. That's not good. I'm going to keep this in the video in case you run into this. I'm going to try going in there one more time. So I didn't really need to do anything. I just restarted the Ubuntu terminal and this time it was fine. <sighs> weird, but it happens. Enter new Unix username, Alex, and then the password and retyped. Now I'm on a Linux environment. Look at that. I can do LS. I'm in my home directory. Very cool. We're going to need this later when we do Python and node development. Now that error condition that happened the first time I ran it, that's been happening for a while since 2019. There's even an open GitHub issue about that. Now you don't have to deal with that ever again. If you ever exit here and you just go back to Ubuntu, you'll be dropped instantly right into the Ubuntu terminal. Let's pop open task manager and I'm actually going to pin this to taskbar too because I like watching the task manager. I know it's kind of a nerdy sick thing to be doing but I like to torture myself and specifically what I want to see is that WSL is in fact running ARM64 and yes yes it is and so is Ubuntu.exe. They're all ARM based. Good to go. Now I do like to have my own working directory for code and for projects. Right now, if I do PWD, it'll tell me I'm in my home directory, which is called Alex. So I'm going to create a new directory called code in here. If I do LS, there's my directory. That's where I'm going to keep all my projects. Now, this is the Ubuntu environment. I'm also going to create a separate code folder for my Windows environment because I'm going to have Windows projects there too. They're not the same code folder. So I'm going to go back to PowerShell in my home directory and create a code folder here. Now, Visual Studio, when you install that, we'll do that later. That creates its own um, source repos folder where it prefers to keep projects, but I usually override that. We'll get into that later. Sometimes you got to use file explorer. So let's pop that open, go to this PC, local users, Alex Z, and there's my code folder right there. I'm going to right click on it and say pin to quick access. And that way it's going to be available right over here. And I'm going to move it up so that I can easily just access my code folder instantly from file explorer. You'll notice down here that you also have your access to Linux from your file explorer. And there's Ubuntu. You also have your home Alex code directory right there. You can pin this one to quick access, but then you might get confused because this one's also called code. If you want quick access to both of them, just rename one of them to something else to make it more obvious which one is which. I don't mind having it this way. There's one setting I had to change back. And if you go to advanced system settings, go to performance settings, and then smooth edges of screen fonts. I'm going to take the performance hit on that one. Fonts are important. They look better when you have smoothing turned on. So yeah, that one can stay. Now it's time to install some tools that we're going to use for development. How long has it been in this video? Oh my gosh, we've just been setting stuff up. Now what's funny about Git is that if you go to Ubuntu and you type in Git, it already has Git installed and you're welcome to use that Git, but you should probably have it in Windows too, because right now, if you say Git in Windows, it's not going to work. To get Git, you have to go and search for Git for Windows. And here it is. Go to Downloads, Windows. Now there's a couple ways of getting git and it tells you right here one of them is to download this 64-bit git and yes it is unfortunately not arm based luckily git is not really intense thing that's gonna require a lot of processing power so it's probably fine you can download the 64-bit git for windows setup or here's a quick way to do it right here using winget if you're not familiar with winget it's kind of like app get on linux or homebrew on max it's already pre-installed on your machine and all you got to do is execute this command to install git let's do that i'm going to copy this command go back to powershell and let's clear this up a little bit now just to make sure you have it just type in winget and there it is if you say winget search git this will search the 
Winget directory to help you out find the packages that you need because the package names are a little bit confusing here. They're not as simple as Chocolatey used to be. Chocolatey is the old package manager for Windows. Winget is now preferred. So the first time you run it, it's gonna ask you if you agree. And I'm gonna say yes. And now it's gonna list all the available packages that contain the word Git. And as you can see, the package names are not exactly super easy. And that's why we're provided with this right here. Winget install dash dash ID git dot git dash e source winget. It's pretty long. You can probably get away with just this. Winget install dash dash ID git dot git. Let's try that. And that's as simple as we can do it. So this is gonna basically just pull down that same git for Windows program without having you download it and run the executable. It's just automatic. And it also figures out what architecture you're running on automatically and installs the right version, except for git, which is only x64. But when we install VS Code, which we can do the same way, it'll grab the right version. So let's do that. I'm gonna just search for it. Winget search VS code and the first one is the one we're looking for as you can see it's not very simple we need to use this id right here microsoft.visualstudio.code so let's say to install it winget install dash dash id and paste microsoft.visualstudio.code let's go there's the installer and if you notice right here it's getting the arm 64 version so that's the right version for us successfully installed how easy was that we can install a lot of software through winget so now i can run code code oh code is not recognized what about git not recognized you know why because we need to restart our terminal so let's close the terminal let's reopen it and now we should have git there it is git now works and we should have code that opens up vs code yes i trust the authors and we're good to go now since we got the terminal open we might as well configure git and to configure it in order to be able to do uh, pull requests or commits you need to set up your username and your email address so that's git config dash dash global user dot name and then your name and same thing for user dot email boom now, since we've configured Git here in Windows, we got it configured also in our Linux, in Ubuntu. So we're gonna do the same thing here as well. Pop open Ubuntu, copy that first line, paste it here, enter, copy that second line, paste it here, enter. Unfortunately, you have to do it twice. There's just, the two Git instances are different. Now, since we're talking about Winget, I just want to show you a quick resource here. If you go to winget.run, this is a quick resource where you can look up packages in a more pleasant way. So <laughs> Git is up here. This will allow you to just copy the command so you don't have to remember what it is. Be careful what you're installing. Make sure you click on it and check to see that it's the right thing. And yes, that was the right thing. You can look up lots of packages here, like uh, Visual Studio, for example. Uh, there's Visual Studio. You can install Visual Studio Community edition visual studio code is here android studio is here so a nice little resource so even though we can install visual studio through winget i'm gonna show you the old-fashioned way of doing it let's search for visual studio that one right there uh there's three editions community professional enterprise there's actually other editions but the free one is community let's get that one the setup file downloads we're gonna open the file and say yes for the installer continue and yes this is going to be the arm version of visual studio which if you've watched my channel uh, i've tested before it works really well at this point dotnet framework is already on arm fully supported so nothing to worry about or concern yourself about so except the workloads that are available here are going to be your more typical workloads there is quite a lot more workloads available on an x64 platform than here out of the box just to give you an idea of what that looks like i did recently set up two machines next to each other a dell with an arm chip and a dell with an intel chip and there was definitely a difference in the workloads available especially if you're doing things like SharePoint development or Azure development and a few other ones, those are only going to be available on the Intel based uh, machines for now. But this is enough for me because I do mostly ASP.NET development, things like Blazor. I don't do game development here. I'll do Linux development on Linux. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Node.js development is an interesting one. You might be tempted to click that, but I'll show you a different way, which I think is better. So we'll do that a little bit later. I'm going to select ASP.NET and web development and click install. So now you're gonna have Visual Studio Code, which is the editor, and then Visual Studio Community 2022, which is the IDE. All right, I, I've made videos what the difference is in the past. And just to make it short, Visual Studio gives you everything out of the box. It's an integrated development environment. Everything is there. Visual Studio Code is a, supposed to be a lightweight editor, at least initially it was. And you can build up your own thing, whatever you want, by adding extensions to it, depending on what you're doing. Visual Studio 
Studio is now installed. That only took a couple minutes to do. I'm going to ignore its suggestion to restart. We're going to restart in a moment, but first I want to run it and create a project real quick just to test it out. You can sign in or create a new account. I'm going to skip this for now. Dark theme is good and I'm going to select web development for my layout. It doesn't really matter. You can change that later. Create a new project and for templates, I'm just going to search for Blazor here. Blazor web app, click next. You can see the location that it chooses is my home directory source and then repos. I'm going to change that to the code directory and let's click next. As of right now, .NET 8 LTS long term support has been installed as the framework. You can install other frameworks later if you need to. Now here I want to show you something interesting. If we select authentication type individual accounts, it needs to store our accounts somewhere. So it's going to create a database, an MDF file on your system. Let's create that and this will scaffold out the solution with the Blazor project. There it is. If you just run this by default, it'll build for ARM. This project configured to use SSL. Yes, 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 and yes. Wow, four times. <laughs> <laughs> so here is our app and it works. This is an ARM app and you can check this by going to good old task manager details and you'll see that our not only our dev environment that's Visual Studio is running at ARM 64. That's good. Our Blazor app, the one that we just created is also ARM 64. Very cool. So if we go to register email, doesn't really matter. Register. Uh, okay. It's got some strict rules here. An unhandled exception occurred. So the reason this is happening is because the SQL Server process, it's not full SQL Server. So you really can't fully utilize the entire spectrum of what's available in ARM here until that SQL Server based process is converted to ARM. And I just don't know if that's happening or when that's happening. So if you want to use that mechanism, you're going to have to connect to a different SQL Server somewhere externally or a different database entirely. All right, you've had your warning. Now, if you have that remote SQL Server database and you need to manage it, you could actually get SQL Server Management Studio right here, SQL Server Management Studio, and we're going to download it and install it. And yes, this one will run on our ARM machine. Click install to begin. Let's go install successfully. Uh, we can just do SSMS here, SQL Server Management Studio, and it's alive. <laughs> just uh, be warned that SSMS is running as an x86 program. Yep, it's an oldie, but a goodie for those that appreciate it. All right, now, SQL Server Management Studio is a great tool because you can connect to remote databases. You can have SQL Server running in Azure, for example, or on a virtual private server, and you can connect to that from your local machine and manage the database that way. We're gonna move on to Node, and there's a couple ways to do this. I'm gonna show you the way I prefer to do it and why. So I like to have uh, the ability to manage my Node versions because Node comes out with a new version. Some projects are not not compatible with it. Other projects are, and then you have to switch versions. Well, how do you easily switch versions? You use something called Node Version Manager. If you were to just install Node, you go to Node.js, you go here, you go download, you go to pre-built installer, and then I want version 20 LTS for Windows running ARM. If you install this, you're gonna be stuck with this version and you won't be able to switch around. That might be fine for what you're doing. Then you'll have Node on Windows and everything will be dandy, but you won't be able to manage your versions. There is something called Node Version Manager for Windows. And when I did my x86 or x64 tutorial, I showed you how to use this with Windows. Unfortunately, though, this does not have an ARM version yet, but that's okay because we're not doing it this way anyway. This will only apply to you if you didn't do WSL and if you're not doing anything with Linux. Uh, I suggest having WSL installed anyway, just because of Node and Python. We'll get into Python momentarily. And if you download and install this NVM Windows, which is x64, every version of Node that it installs is going to be x64 version of Node, which you do not want. You absolutely do not want that because then everything you run through Node will run through Prism, which is the translation layer. So here's a different way to do it. You open up Ubuntu and your Linux instance and you do NVM here. All your Node stuff will go through Linux. To get the latest command for installing the latest version of NVM, head over to this address right here for NVM. It's open source. It's on GitHub and go to install and update script. This is what we're going to run right here. Either one of these will work. Let's take that first one and paste it in. Paste it into your Ubuntu. Good. Now run NVM on the command line and it's not found. So let's close 
and reopen Ubuntu. Now run NVM dash dash version and there it is. Now to install Node, it's simple. NVM install and then the version of Node you want. You want 18? Type in 18. It's going to download and install Node 18. Done. NVM use 18. Now we're using Node 18. So if you type Node version 18. Now if you want version 20 of Node, NVM install 20. Downloading 20, done. NVM use 20. And now if we check node version, 20. And we can switch back and forth between versions that easily. This is why we do it this way. And guess what? If we take a look at which node, it's gonna tell me the path of the node file. Let's copy that and do file, paste. Look at that. It's gonna tell me information about that file. And it's an ARCH64 ARM process. So this is the ARM version of node. Perfect. I'll quickly demonstrate this for you. We run node and we do four var i equals zero, i is less than a very big number, i plus plus, and we'll do a, a loop doing nothing. Is that even running? Did we get optimized? Oh, okay. My number wasn't big enough. It's running. It's running that silly loop that does nothing. But let's take a look at Activity Monitor now. VMemWSL is that process. It's uh, taken up just over a gig of RAM and now it stopped and the process goes away. But it is an ARM based process. Now, if you're concerned about doing things in Ubuntu, like your projects, for example, don't worry. Go to your code folder and create a project here. Make node test and we can open this up in VS Code just like that. From Ubuntu, it's going to open up VS Code in Windows that you've already installed. How cool is that? And it says the host is not found. Do you want to allow, permanently allow, and allow? And now this instance of VS Code is editing the file that's in Linux, but it's running in Windows. It's it's crazy, I know. So you can add your JavaScript files here, console dot hello world. And yes, semicolons is the only way, proper way. It's not the only way, it's the proper way to write JavaScript. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go back to uh, Ubuntu here, CD node test, and we can do node in the .js. Hello world. Done. Coffee break. Now, moving on to Python. We're going to treat Python in a similar way. And instead of installing something in Windows that's going to be permanent and very static, I'm going to install the same kind of version manager slash environment manager, not really version manager. It's more like an environment manager where all your projects can live in a separate environment. And that's called Miniconda. Search for Miniconda. There it is. Click on latest Miniconda installer. <laughs> Alternative, you can go to anaconda.com and in the left navigation, open Open up Miniconda, latest Miniconda installer links. And let's scroll down here. So here you've got your Windows installers. You could, if, if you're still bypassing WSL, you could just grab one of these. But be warned, they don't have an ARM version. Okay, so it's going to run slower. Don't do it. Do WSL. Come on. Mac OS installers. We'll skip that. Um, I do have a lot of Mac tutorials here as well. If you are interested in that. Linux installers. Here we go. Specifically, we want this one. Miniconda Linux Arch 64. <laughs> <laughs> so that means ARM Architecture 64. We're not going to do the installer. What we're going to do is go down here to, well, where's the other stuff? Installing Miniconda. No, I want the script. Ah, right here. Quick command line install. That's what we want. Yes. Not easy to find sometimes, but you'll get there. You'll get there. Switch to Linux and um, do these steps right here. Except uh, I'll show you where to be careful. Okay, so first we're going to do this step right here. Make directory, Miniconda, copy. Uh, let's go to our Linux instance and let's back out to our home directory. So that would be PWD, my name. Well, it's going to be your name, but yeah. You get it. Make directory miniconda. So now we have that directory right there. Now we're going to run this next script, which is going to be the w get script, but we're going to change it a little bit. Copy this, paste, and the command they give you is to download the um, 8664 version. We need to change that to arch64, <laughs> aarch64.sh, so we get the right architecture file downloaded. And yeah, there it goes. Now we have that file and we can execute it. We execute it using uh, this, this command right here. Copy, paste, boom. So now it's installing and done. If we run conda, it's not found. But again, let's restart our Ubuntu environment and run conda dash dash version, conda not found. And that's because we got a couple of other commands to do. This command right here is going to register conda with your shell. So let's copy that first one right there and paste it. Hopefully that did something. Yes, it modified the bash RC file. And now it says for changes 
just take effect, close and reopen your shell. Let's do that again. And now we should have Conda. And in fact, I do see that we have Conda because you'll see here, we now have base in parentheses, which is the base environment. Now to create a new Python environment, you say Conda create dash dash name and the name of the environment. So let's say you wanted to um, work on some llama stuff, the LLM. So you create a new environment called llama one and you can give it the Python version that you want it to execute under Python equals 3.11 enter and let's go. So this created a new environment with Python 11. It doesn't have llama installed. It's just a name. So to activate that we write conda activate and it tells you what to do right there conda activate llama one when you execute that instead of base now you see llama one in parentheses it tells you where you are what environment you're in if you want to leave the environment you say conda deactivate and now you're back to base so in base if we say python dash dash version it's 3.12 but if we go to llama python version is 3.11 so it's it's version management but it's also environment management each environment can have a different version of python or they can have the same version of python cd code make dir python test code python test let's create a new file main.py print hello world cd python test and now we just do python main well this is a little bit embarrassing i need parentheses and here i am trying to lecture people on using proper syntax and i missed a parens come on alex what's wrong with me hello world there we go there's our python program and you can take it from there i got one really popular tool for you to see that's docker and finally as a bonus at the end a magical tool that's going to do a lot of things for you on windows so let's start with docker we're going to close out of ubuntu i'm going to show you something announcing docker desktop support for windows on arm this is may 23rd 24 so that's pretty recent in fact if you go and try to download this they don't have the arm version yet for windows on their download page but there is a way of course go to powershell we're going to use our friend winget quick search for docker will show us this package right here with this id and this version is the first version that supports windows on arm 4.31.1 so we're gonna use that winget install dash 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 id and paste that in docker dot docker desktop and we're off take a look at where it's grabbing it from desktop to docker.com slash win slash main arm 64 that's the right one make sure that's the one that's being downloaded successfully installed it even put a nice little icon on my desktop let's run it and see what's going on well unexpected error let's reboot been a while all right i've just rebooted and this popped up so i guess we're good to go welcome to docker desktop see a nice reboot fixes everything on windows that's the way it's been and looks like that's the way it's gonna be for a while Looks like by default, they're using WSL2 based engine which is good quick peek at task manager and i'm seeing that all the docker processes are arm 64 nice now i did say there was one more tool that's gonna help out your whole windows experience and that's called power toys you can get it from the app store but there's an easier way and it's free by the way and it's open source pop open the terminal winget install dash dash id microsoft dot power toys boom successfully installed and it starts up what is power toys <laughs> well it gives you all these tools right out of the box check out advanced paste you can copy a bit of python code and paste it as c sharp code what that's crazy always on top just just what it sounds like awake keeps your machine awake if you're doing some kind of long process and you don't want it to sleep and you didn't set the power options like i showed you early in the video color picker command not found tells you how to fix your command or what you need to do to install the missing tool environmental variables launch environmental variables that's always a pain to get to but here it is right here user system add variable name and value easy fancy zones shift drag the window and put it in a separate zone these are the ones that are not available out of the box there's more options here file locksmith ever have a problem where you couldn't delete a file on windows i'm, I'm sure everybody has this thing will unlock it for you it'll tell you what tasks are using a file just really cool stuff get it and use it you're gonna love it so hopefully this will get you up and going with your development environment on windows on arm now i'm on a surface x elite right now i also have the surface plus and the previous generation of surface with an intel i'm gonna be doing performance testing on these now so make sure you stay tuned for those videos if you're interested in that otherwise thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next one